So, um, so Julian, this is this is fascinating to be working with you on this project because um, I I'm just so eager to see what you're going to be bringing to this um, in terms of uh, the stereotypes that we think of in terms of bel canto. Uh -huh. Bel canto is a fun term. It really kind of got started being talked about as bel canto in the 19th century, even though its origins were traced much back, further back, 17th and 18th century. But um, it was invented kind of as a contradistinction to Wagner. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, exactly, because uh, the bel canto style was about making beautiful lines and letting uh, whatever vocal needs be supreme over what textual needs necessarily. And Wagner came along and it was all about drama. It was all about, uh, you know, the narrative and the text. Right. Um, and so that's why it kind of became a big, a much discussed topic. So, so then in terms of uh, Rossini, I mean, and, and this is the thing, you are, you are a singer musicologist. Yeah. And um, so understanding uh, how Rossini kind of fits, uh, comes out of that, but yet there were some distinctions where they're not, that he did not care for singers embellishing their own lines as much. Yes, that's exactly right. It's interesting because today in, in the opera houses, that's exactly what happens with Rossini is many, many added cadences and high notes, et cetera, transposing of big solos, et cetera. Rossini himself lamented uh, the fact that he thought bel canto had begun to die. He was upset. He couldn't seem to find enough bel canto singers to suit him. He did end up for this, I guess, at the premiere, using two Italian sisters for the soprano and contralto. Right. And I think he used, I forget, one of the guys was definitely a Belgian, um, but he still obviously was drawn to the Italian singers because they, they had more of an idea of the, of the history that, uh, that Rossini's thinking was coming from at the right. time. But there are singers in Italy today, I, I believe that there's an unbroken tradition of how to sing Rossini coloratura in a glottal fashion. Uh, for example, these days modern voice teachers often say, if you sing glottally, you'll hurt your voice. But um, the truth is you really can't sing the Rossini passages um, at any kind of reasonable speed unless you do use a glottal articulation. And I could, I could demonstrate the difference if you wanted. Yes, please. So let's just say Handel's Rejoice. A glottal articulation might be Choice. But a, an articulation that involved more connection might sound like Choice. I don't know if you oh, can yes. hear the difference between those two. Oh, indeed. But you can go a lot faster you can sing a lot faster with glottal articulation, and in Rossini, fast is the name of the game. Indeed, yeah. Uh, so, so then there's a there's the other word that we know so much from our work in Baroque music, the mezza di voce. Right, mezza di voce. It's past participle of mettere la voce to place the voice, and. In the 18th century, anyway, if you had found the perfect placement for a note in your range, that meant that you could do anything on it. You could crescendo it and decrescendo it to, to nothingness, adding a vibrato in the middle of the mezzo di voce, as it were. You could also trill, um, uh, and I forget, maybe even one other ornament uh, that you could, you were supposed to be able, the trill is the main thing, and the adding in and out of the vibrato on the mezzo di voce, but it implies perfect placement. Right. We think today mezzo di voce just means this, but it really means... Um, and it's a crescendo and diminuendo within a note. And it, it means such a perfect placement that you can do anything. You can trill. And in fact, in the 18th century, you weren't allowed to claim a note in your range unless you could trill on it, uh -huh. which a lot of people myself included, you know, and it, it would cut out a certain amount of your, you know, your best range. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was, the technique for the bel canto was just so spectacular, you know, just uh, really, really well-trained voices could do anything with their voice. You see also a lot of things um, in these scores were really, and, and, and specifically in this score, you have four, four, four piani or four fortissimos. And, right. Um, and then, of course, the distinction between uh, Sotto voce, mezzo voce. Right. So, what does that? What, what do you think that that implies? Well, for a singer. 
certainly to sing four P's, which Verdi also writes at the end of Celeste I get for the poor tenor. Oh. <laughs> um, four P's, what does that imply? It, it, it does not necessarily imply full voice, obviously, it's four P's. It also really helps if the instrument that is uh, doing the accompaniment has a light enough action so that the decay is quicker. And so that allows the singer to really come down to the lowest part of their dynamics, you know. And so singing with real attention to dynamics is certainly a bel canto tradition. Uh, and it looks to me like Rossini has indicated quite a lot of very specific. Um, he seems to know what he wants on, yes. on the page. This is not a lot left to the imagination, which is, which is very interesting. But yet, at the same time, um, as we were just reading through that, um, d d I, I found myself, because I'm just playing, you know, but well, the way you sang it, I found myself not having to keep strict time at all. Oh, sense. tempo rubato. Yes. Another aspect of bel canto. Tempo rubato exists two ways. You either steal the time by slowing down, and then you have to catch it up, by speeding up, or you can do the opposite, which is speed up and then slow down. But the goal, the goal is then on the individual performer. It's the, it's the will of the soloist, as it were, to, to add to what is the blueprint of the, uh, provided by the performance. It's an invitation to, to mess with the time. And I think um, it's my opinion that silence the use of silence, uh, which is recommended by Tozzi in 1723, says if you want your audience to really get quiet, just stop. Hmm. And also the tempo rubata are just very, very wonderful techniques uh, and necessary for, for Rossini. I, I was, uh, you know, as I've been preparing the chorus for this, um, you know, I, I've been trying to, to tell them a couple of different interesting things. One is that, um, I think there's a reason why this music appears in all of the Bugs Bunny cartoons, because it has enormous amounts of humor. And when you think that he was writing up to two, three, four operas in a year um, at this voracious speed, um, that, that really, I think, so much is really left up to us as the performers, and that's really what I'm looking forward to, working with the quartet, yes. um, you know, in, in what we're going to be able to bring to the, to the score, not in this sort of very reverential way, uh, but but just just to see, um, I think the, the, the sort of the delight that comes from from this music. Mm -hmm. um, so one last thing that, that uh, you, you mentioned the word vibrato. You're right. And and so now this this of course is a very contentious issue. Right. Um, I think as we were discussing earlier, that uh, we, we sort of think of, of the revival of this repertoire coming primarily through people like Joan Sutherland right. and Maria Callas. Maria, of course, had such a such a whopper of a voice. Yeah. Um, although it's amazing how much she could make it move. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But but yet, of course, you know, research has gone even so much further since even the high you know the, the high point of their time. And so so, what about vibrato? And, and great great question. Um, coming out of the eighteenth century, I'll tell you that a singer had to be able to add and or take out vibrato. So it, it was both, vibrato was an ornament, and, and straight tongue was also an ornament mm -hmm. for expressive purposes. Um, and I think that this is part of what characterizes some of the best singers of the 19th century, is that they, uh, they show what they can do with their voice. Part of the performance is a little bit like an acrobatic act. You, know, you want to be able to show how high you can sing, how long you can hold a note, and the ability to take in, out, in the vibrato and out, put it in and out, because it ends up being a factor of excitement. I think most really great singers understand that. I think Pavarotti understood it, for example. He knew how to make what I call a vibrato crescendo, which is he would start with a vibrato, his normal vibrato, and then he would actually speed it up right. to the end of the note. So it ends up kind of putting a big exclamation point on the end of the, um, the words, often the last note of the piece. So it's a tremendous expressive device. Um, 
does it hurt your voice not to sing with vibrato? I'm sure that's, uh, that's the leading question still among in vocal studios. I think it can be a problem if you are in the very high end of your voice. Mm -hmm. I would say in your speaking range, no problem. You know, even maybe up to your break, no problem. And after that, I think you need to be a little careful. Mm -hmm. You know, just for the health's sake, because it's, you know, the voice is in extremis, you know, and uh, there's more, more pressure. Now that's, that's very interesting. Well, and I've, uh, you know, been following your recording career for years, and so I, I noticed that you, you, you can do them all. <laughs> so, and, and yes. that's all living proof for the fact that, you know. Uh, Doesn't kill you. No, but that you've always put the expressivity first. Oh, thanks. And uh, that's, that's what's, what I'm very much looking forward to, a very, very different reading of, of Rossini. And, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, there's one, all these wonderful recordings. Uh -huh. Of course, now all you can find them on YouTube. And Amelita yes. that you forwarded to me, which is something that I, a recording I, I knew from years and years ago. Um, and it's it's kind of like seeing like a window into the 19th century, isn't it? It's, we're so lucky to have those old recordings. Um, yeah, and I love I love what she does. I think no one has ever surpassed her in a certain repertoire, and we know that it was not um, done in multiple takes. It was one time through and at spectacular levels. Uh, and so ability you, to just just part of what she does is besides singing expressively. Oh, I wanted to mention. Um, Sometimes uh, singers today are taught to make a wall of sound, and the goal is to sustain in the same sound all through every note. Mm -hmm. And there's so much uh, nuance in this, lots of little slurs, which to my mind um, suggest pulling back from the sound, you know, mm -hmm. really making phrasing that, uh, that dies a little bit it, instead of just pushes through. So um, I'm looking forward to, to, to that, those sorts of things in our performance as well. Well, you know, we're lucky that we don't have to, uh, we're not going to be in a padded 2,000 seat hall, but we're going to be in a 400 seat stone church, which of course is closer to probably what Rossini's intention was in, in the little chapel that, that this was written for, the That's dedication. Right. Um, so, so uh, if, if we were to, uh, the last thing I was going to talk about to you is uh, the use of the portamento as well. Uh -huh. Well, it's kind of like the wall of sound that I was just talking about, um, in that a, a modern singer might sing, for example, Oh, salutare, And I might want to do, changes to what's there, um, phrasing after the O as opposed to just, you know, one con, con but basically I remember hearing when I was a student at Eastman, the consonants are just an interruption to the sound, ah. which tells you something right there, it's like, yeah. they're in the way, <laughs> right. the words are in the way, it somehow in, in, in many, I think, what we call modern schools of singing. It's interesting. Uh, I, I actually, a wonderful mentor for me was a, uh, was a, a singer. Um, he, he actually uh, loved to sing in German uh -huh. because he said the consonants were such a great help. He actually always told me that he never focused as much on the vowels, but he focused on the consonants. In born der schönen Monat Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, he had that kind of spectacular old, old, old school sound, I would say, that, mm -hmm. that, that actually kind of predates what we think of the modern singers of the 60s. You had asked about the portamento, though, and I kind yes. of uh, you know, went backwards a little bit. But um, I think a, a 20th century portamento is like, as opposed to what I think of as more coming out of the 18th century, which I believe this is closer to, the Rossini is closer to, which is right. In other words, not dragging the voice through all the chromatics of the, uh, of the scale, as it were, but actually picking a point 
um, which allows some finesse that is closer to where you're going, mm -hmm. like a third below maybe or a fourth below where you're going, but not the whole octave or fifth. So maybe, I, I was just curious, if we could just take like the first phrase of this. There's a couple of interesting things for me. First of all, O is clearly a pickup, even though it's on the downbeat, isn't it? Right. So the first really stressed syllable is sa, mm -hmm. lu, and then the proper accent of the word is dadis, which is, which is on the second measure. So, and then if we were to, to incorporate some of these things, so you have a crescendo, you have a forte in the word ostia. Mm -hmm. so, the de, um, so then again, on beat one, you have the least accented syllable. And you have an accent over the word ke. Seri, panis, ostiu. So therefore, all of the things that, that we deal with in our students and in our performances of getting people to go against the grain of the downbeat. Right. So can we try that whole sure, phrase? Sure, sure, sure. Let's try it. So. Obviously, it's it's a different style, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and it's a different accent. Mm -hmm. Not just even the language side, um, you, you know, uh, but 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 so much of the same musical values are are very very are present. present. Yeah. Yes. Julianne, thank you oh, so very much. You're so welcome. Thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs>